Hi there and welcome back to Forensics 101. My name is Matt Cartledge and I'm a Forensic Science student at the University of Hull. Today's video we're going to be talking about footwear impressions, uh, impressions that are left behind at a crime scene and we're also going to be making a plaster cast of our very own footwear impression that's been left behind in some sand. We're going to talk about the different kinds of um, prints that can be left behind being patent, latent or plastic. All right, so let's get on with it. Footwear impressions can show direction of travel and movement around a crime scene, uh, where a property was entered and also exited. For example, shoe prints in a muddy flower bed beneath a window and a muddy print inside the property below the window show a likely point of entry. We can suggest that the exit would be uh, the bloody shoe prints leading out the back door. So why are shoe prints so valuable? Um, let's take a brand new pair of running shoes for example. Um, they're unlikely to have any unique characteristics and therefore would only possess the class characteristics of that particular make and model of shoe, which is identical to a brand new pair of shoes that someone else has just purchased. What forensic scientists and crime scene investigators are looking for are the unique characteristics normally on an older pair of shoes. They could be the, the wear marks, the debris, the cuts, the striations on the tread pattern at the sole of a shoe. Um, and another good thing about this is linkage of crime scenes. If a single uh, suspect has committed more than one offence, maybe a, a string of robberies, um, that particular shoe, if it's got unique characteristics, can then be linked to the other crime scenes and therefore one suspect, three crimes that have been committed, can be solved at once. So here in the UK, our police forces, they use the National Footwear Reference Collection. Uh, and in that collection, there's 30,000 footwear uh, patterns and uh, a list of the manufacturers, uh, the countries that they're sold in. Um, in. In the US, for example, maybe shoes are only sold in certain states. Uh, in the US, I believe they call it the National Footwear Database. Now you may be familiar with Ted or Theodore Kitsinski. Uh, he's the infamous Unibomber. He evaded capture for 18 years after killing three people and injuring a, thir a further 23 with 16 mil bombs from 1978 to 1996. Theodore would deceive investigators by attaching smaller soles to his footwear, making it impossible for his shoe to be identified. Uh, and he knew that the investigators could take a rough estimation of an adult's height uh, with a simple calculation that the, the sole of your shoe uh, would be 15% of your total height. So there are three different types of footprints that can be left at a crime scene. Um, there are latent, uh, these are invisible to the naked eye, they normally need to be lifted um, with electrostatic dust lifters using oblique lighting or a gel lifter. Um, you also need to get images of these um, in order to be processed and analysed. You also have Patent. So the patent are clearly visible impressions or prints from the transfer of material picked up on the footwear, such as it could be blood, dust, dirt, soil, etc. Um, but these would all require different lifting techniques. And the third one is plastic prints. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So these are three dimensional prints. Uh, they could be impressions left in soil, dirt, snow, uh, or even sand. Uh, they're easily visible. No alternate light source is really needed but it does show depth if you use one uh, and a plaster cast using a dental stone is the best way to pick up these impressions unless it's in snow um, because snow obviously being really cold a dental stone will actually heat up um, and melt the snow and you're going to lose all that detail okay so let's talk about what happens at the crime scene so first of all we need to make sure exclusionary shoe prints are taken of all the staff and officers working at the scene um, also, walking plates need to be used. Um, this basically raises the investigators off the ground uh, and stops contaminating the evidence or uh, stepping over uh, latent prints. So, patent prints, uh, such as shoe prints in blood or fine dirt, are often simply photographed and could be seen very well through the lens as they lie. Others, such as dusty prints, may require an alternative light source to emphasize rich detail for a really detailed photograph. Either way, the photograph must always be taken at 90 degrees to the surface with a print in the center of the viewfinder to prevent any distortion that may be misleading during later analysis. And an L-shaped ruler uh, must be laid beside the print for precise measurements uh, later. Latent prints, they're not so readily visible to the naked eye. 
and can prove meticulous to find. Even shoes that appear clean pick up oils, dirt and fine particles that can be transferred to glass, uh, tiles, wooden floors and even on carpets. Sometimes instead of the shoes transferring dirt from the shoe to the surface, uh, the shoe can pick up dirt from a surface to the shoe leaving a negative print. Uh, this is more common on surfaces that have just been recently polished or waxed leaving behind a residue. So lifting latent shoe prints are traits similar to latent fingerprints. They can be dusted with a uh, dusting powder and photographed and then lifted with uh, an adhesive tape. For dust on fine particle prints, um, they can be lifted using an electrostatic lifting device. We're going to look at one of these later on in another video. And, and they electrostatically attract the print onto a sheet of metallized mylar film and that can be stored for later analysis. Prints in blood can be photographed as they are. But if uh, the print is very faint, a solution called luminol, again, we're going to look at luminol in another video, and this can be used, which reacts with the hemoglobin in the blood, the iron containing hemoglobin, and bioluminescence to reveal the print. This method can even work after the blood has been cleaned away due to its high level of sensitivity. So plastic prints, as plastic prints are 3D, taking just a photograph can be a little bit more difficult due to the depth of the impression. So shining a light um, at a lower angle to the impression can help visualize the depth better for photography. Sand and snow impressions may need to be sprayed with a dark colored spray paint before being photographed, not always, but sometimes um, due to the light color of the substrate. Soft mud and sand impressions may also be stabilized with an acrylic lacquer or hairspray to prevent them from deforming under the weight of the casting material that's going to be used, uh, which would be the next step for recording the impression. Uh, not always required, um, maybe if it's dusty sand, then it should be required. If it's, it's, it's damp and there's moisture in the sand, it should hold itself up against the weight. So anyway, let's crack on and let's give it a try ourselves. Okay, so casting the impression. This box of sand here is our hypothetical crime scene. Let's say we found a body on the beach under suspicious circumstances with footprints leading away. I have an old shoe here with lots of wear and tear, so we should get a really nice detailed impression. We refer to these as plastic prints because they are three dimensional. First of all, as always, you would take a photograph for the record with the scale. And then we're gonna start mixing our dental stone. As the name suggests, this is used by dentists to make cast impressions of your teeth. This is a one kilogram bag and it does dry rather quickly, probably 30 minutes. So we're gonna mix nine fluid ounces of water initially to the one kilogram bag of dental stone. And we're gonna mix that up. Now we want a consistency somewhat like um, pancake mix. Um, not too watery, but not too thick. We want this to run smoothly into all of the detail in the impression. So just add a little bit more water, more water there to get the powder out the corners and that should do it. Really nice consistency there. And again, just open a corner of the bag here and we're gonna to start to pour. We're gonna pour from the side of the impression and let it flow into. We don't wanna pour from too, too, uh, too much of a height. Um, because obviously as it falls it may damage any of the um, detail that we've got we don't want to lose that and as we pour we pour over what's already been poured and let it push and flow what's already been laid down we really want to empty this bag flatten it down a little bit and then we're going to let that set for just about five minutes Okay, so five minutes later, we're going to inscribe my initials because I was the one that made the cast, um, the date that the impression was taken, as well as any other information on there, like the case number. Okay, so looking at the suspect's footwear, let's um, say we found a suspect, and at the residence we found some shoes that we think may match our impression. Um, it would be inked. Um, I'm just using some Japanese calligraphy ink here. That's all I had at hand, uh, so just this demonstration. But it would be very, very similar to this process, whereby the sole of the shoe would be inked and then laid over a piece of acetate. As you can see, when I lift this shoe up, that's, that's a brilliant print, got lots of detail there. It's not as high definition as I would have liked, 
um, I would have probably tried this again. But there you have it. Lots of nice detail. And that can then later be um, referred to when we have our cast impression finished. Okay, so 30 minutes later and the cast is now rock hard. It's still rather warm to the touch due to the exothermic reaction that's uh, created when we add the water to the dental stone. Um, as we lift it, if this was on a beach, we'd lift it up. We'd still get lots of excess um, sand there um, because this sand is quite moist. I didn't spray the sand beforehand black for any detail. I just left it as it was. I knew the sand wasn't going to fall. Um, fall apart or be disturbed so much due to the moisture in the sand. If it was fine sand, uh, you might want to fix this with a fixing spray. So once we have our impression, we can then package that up nicely and send that off to the lab. And in the lab, they'll probably take a bit more care and attention in revealing the rest of the detail. So I'm just using a, a soft bristle brush here, toothbrush. Um, to get rid of most of the excess sand and then you can come in with a smaller brush for finer detail and then eventually um, we could just even use a little bit of water on the top of that brush and get any of the uh, dry loose sand off there but you can already see that's a really nice impression lots of detail that can be uh, analyzed there is a crease in the middle of this I'm assuming that's because I poured from the middle to the right, maybe I should have gone from the rear of the shoe impression to the front. Um, so the center actually dried a little bit too fast. Okay, so as just uh, overlaying, you can see how similar the print was against the impression. And that's just how much detail you've actually got. And here's a few examples from real cram scenes. But uh, I just want to say I hope you uh, enjoyed this video, um, give it a go, it is a bit of fun and please make sure that you like, if you want to comment, ask for any future videos, um, I'm willing to um, take them on board um, and also subscribe if you can, I do have some more videos coming up very very soon. Thanks for watching.